Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending uh, this event tonight. Um, so today, we're going to be exposed uh, to gravity in many different challenging, novel, and creative ways. And you're going to be exposed and to, to this concept, to this physical concept, from an artistic point of view and from a scientific point of view. Now, my job here, my role for these next 30 minutes, will be to tell you, as a theoretical physicist, how do we think about gravity, what are the challenges, uh, uh, what are the new ideas, uh, what are the questions, what is the knowledge, how are we advancing that knowledge, and how we're moving forward. And in particular, my, my area of theoretical physics is in the realm of quantum gravity, and I'm a string theorist. And um, you might think, if you hear those words, you're like, oh, she's super, super specialized. This is like one area, one little corner, just studying quantum gravity. But my goal, what I hope afterwards, when you go back home, uh, what I want to do is to encompass to you that when someone nowadays studies quantum gravity, you're not studying only one subject in theoretical physics. This is a broad, very diverse area in theoretical physics that requires many, many, many different tools, many different expertise. This is a very collaborative area in physics. And uh, this is what I want to illustrate, that it's not going to be about a single individual or one genius that came up here and told you about quantum gravity. It's about a collective and about the synergies and the new ideas that come when many different areas come together and we make breakthroughs from that point of view. Now, in that context, since I want to talk about uh, this collaboration, I find it really, really, really useful to make analogies with engineering. So let's imagine you're an engineer, and I'm not. Ah, too many. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I'm truly a theoretical physicist. So, um, <laughs> if I was an engineer um, and I could make this work, it, what I would think about is like, okay, I want to build a very modern infrastructure, a skyscraper, a tall building. Uh, and as an engineer, uh, your challenge is basically to come with a very creative uh, design, with a novel design. And for that, uh, you need to find uh, materials, you need to find uh, the right blueprints, uh, you need to find the appropriate tools in order to achieve your goal of building the building. Now, uh, these concepts that are very familiar to engineers also apply in my own area as a theoretical physicist. So when I talk about blueprints, and I will make these analogies throughout the presentation, I want you to think in terms of principles and laws that govern uh, physics. Okay, so these are basically the equations and the, and the laws that we believe of how nature uh, is behaving. In terms of materials, how they're going to encounter in, the, in, in this talk today, they're going to come through the particles that we have, their interactions, how they talk to each other, and also, very importantly, in the context of gravity, the geometry, and we'll experience that. And finally, the tools it usually encompasses the mathematics, and that's what I'm uh, very succinctly referring to as like the creative part of the solution. So how do we use different mathematical concepts or even physical concepts to go overcome uh, our obstacles? Very good. Now, Applying this to gravity, what we're going to do is we're going to take a journey. So gravity manifests itself at different scales. So what we're very used to, what is mundane to us, is classical gravity, Newtonian gravity. Uh, this is the, the in, in, in our room right now, you, see, you feel the pull. This is how we experience gravity in, in, in everyday life. However, gravity doesn't just manifest itself in our daily life, it also manifests itself in the quantum realm. And that's the journey that I want to take you. I want to start from the classical and go all the way to the quantum side. 
And for that, uh, we'll have to introduce some concepts and, and tell you what are our, our guides through it. And so the first thing that we're going to do is that we're going to uh, go through the concept of general relativity, Einstein's description of gravitation, and we're going to discuss black holes. And then black holes in the context of how the quantum world meets the classical world. Okay, so how black holes contain that information. And the new thing that I want to share with you in, in our aim to understand uh, quantum gravity is this concept that we call the holographic principle. This is a very modern way how we try to understand gravitational physics in the theoretical uh, realm and how we aim to understand what quantum gravity is. So connecting again with my engineering analogy, think of quantum gravity as the skyscraper. Okay, this is what I want to build. Uh, this will be my fantastic outcome, hopefully <laughs> while I'm still alive, uh, of understanding what quantum gravity is. And in that process, in trying to get there, uh, we'll see how black holes provide blueprints for us. They tell us what are we supposed um, to reproduce and to uh, account for. And the holographic principle that I'm mentioning here will tell us about how do you think about building that building in terms of materials and tools that you can use, okay? So, and this is going to be quite uh, key, okay? So this is really why, where I have to put in, in, uh, in action, uh, how do I implement, once I have some idea of what I am allowed to design, how can I find creative solutions to build that fantastic building that will wait for us at the end. Very good. So, we're ready for the journey? Yes. Okay, very <laughs> good. I will not ask questions, don't worry. There's no test and you'll be fine. Very good. So, gravity. So gravity is very familiar. It's one of the forces that we all experience and we understand. Uh, the typical example is of the apple that falls to the ground, okay? And this is something I hope none of us will ever dispute if I drop the apple. It will drop, <laughs> right? <laughs> As the sentence says. Now, uh, the way that gravity controls this, it's pulling you down in your chairs and preventing you from floating around in this room. It is also the force, it's the attractive force that also governs the motions of planets. For instance, the motion of Earth around the sun is basically dictated by that same force, okay? And we draw arrows to indicate that there's an attraction and there's an attraction that depends on how massive an object is. This is our classical understanding of gravity. Now, this is a perfectly fine way how to understand gravity. There's no problem with it. It makes predictions. Uh, it has beautiful equations. You, if uh, in high school or in university you studied it, it's all perfectly fine. Nobody li lied to you. It's a perfectly fine theory. Now, it has limitations. It's good for, for our sizes and for the solar system, perfectly fine. Uh, however, it has limitations, and this required us to improve our knowledge, to go further and have a new modern understanding of gravity. And our modern understanding of gravity, via uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, is through a geometrical understanding, where we get rid of the arrows. There's no more concept of force, but it's basically an idea where motion is dictated by how space and time curves. So here, I have a fantastic uh, helper, Professor de Tournay, that traveled all the way from Brussels to help me out. <laughs> Say hi to Stefan. <laughs> and we're going to do something, uh, we're theorists, so if the experiment fails, it's because I'm a theorist, I'm not an experimentalist. But I want to illustrate this picture here, where you see a big body in the middle and a small body orbiting it. And I want to illustrate in this way how gravity works. And here we have a trampoline that is also going to be used for your artistic understanding of gravity. And what I want to show here, for instance, so right now in the trampoline, uh, there's nothing, okay? So the surface is completely flat. And so if I have a little planet that I'm going to throw to Stefan, hopefully as straight as I can, <laughs> 
it, it will just go straight because there's nothing preventing it from not going straight. Okay? And that's basically the absence of gravity. And there we go. Very good. But now uh, we're going to put some mass. Uh, well, Stefan is not very big, but uh, he is quite. Uh, he does have some mass, and so he's deforming the the surface here, uh, and he's making ripples. He's affecting the geometry of the trampoline as he jumps up and down. <laughs> and I'm going to throw the ball, and the ball's motion is going to be affected because uh, Stefan is basically tampering with the surface of the trampoline. <laughs> And that's basically how we understand gravity. <laughs> uh, we don't jump around in our offices like this. <laughs> that's not something that we do. Uh, but this is our modern understanding uh, of gravity, where this surface here <laughs> is basically depicting to us how the, the gravitational force uh, gets, uh, behaves. So thank you, Stefan. Very good. So th this is a modern understanding. This is general relativity. Now, it's described by uh, this equation that I wrote here on the top. Uh, this is an equation which basically tells us how gravity is connected to matter. Uh, so if you put objects uh, that have mass or have energy, it distorts the space-time, and everything gets affected to it. So the first image towards this side tells you how light gets affected by it. So light is also sensitive uh, to gravity. How objects of different mass, depending on how much mass you have, how much you're going to distort uh, the shape of space and time. Okay? So in a nutshell, what I want you to remember is that gravity is geometry. Okay? Our understanding of gravitational physics is through geometry. And this tells us how we move, what is the dynamics, uh, what are the motions that are allowed, uh, and how we're going to orbit or fall or do other types of things. Okay? So this is our modern understanding from uh, basically the 1900s. Now, um, in this framework, uh, so it also it's good at describing classical mechanics, but as well it makes new predictions. So there's new phenomena and new concepts that come in, and one of the concepts that is uh, quite famous is the concept of a black hole. So a black hole in this, uh, in this analogy is basically a situation where you start piling up a lot, a lot, a lot of mass okay, into a small region of space-time. And gravity becomes so intense in that region of space-time that nothing can escape, not even light. So that's why we call it black. You can think of it, a very good analogy, um, is like being in a, in a river that then suddenly has like a waterfall. So if you're in a boat on the river, and then you hit this waterfall and you fall, then you're, you, you won't be able to go back up. Okay, so that the black hole is doing the same thing, and it treats everything in the same way, and even not even light can escape. Okay, so it's a very extreme uh, situation that is predicted by uh, Einstein's equations of general relativity. Now, black holes, uh, in our, uh, they, they came about from the mathematical framework, and in that sense, uh, they have invaded our science fiction, our imaginations, they have invaded our movies. Uh, there's quite a lot of fantasy and ideas and dreams about like, oh, what is a black hole and what can they do? As a theorist, also for many decades, uh, we basically test them <laughs> literally by looking at what the equations predict and trying to understand their, their properties in a quite abstract way and in a quantum uh, Rome that we'll explore in a moment, we also want to understand what are the inner workings uh, of black holes. But something that has been quite novel, interesting, and revolutionary from this past uh, decades is that we don't have to imagine black holes anymore. Black holes are not just part of science fiction and something abstract that will be foreign to us. Black holes, actually, nowadays, are things that we can infer that we can intuit, that we can hear, and that we can see. So they're not a mathematical artifact, they're not some uh, bizarre thing that came from some equations that look sort of ugly. 
the real physical objects that exist in our universe. In particular, the first signals of black holes, the way that we infer them, came from uh, this, this picture that I'm showing here, uh, comes basically from studying the motion of stars very close to the center of our galaxy. And the conclusion from studying the motions of stars very close to the center of the galaxy was that there was a black hole there in the middle. This was granted the Nobel Prize in the year 2020, the Nobel Prize for Physics. Now, more impressively, uh, in this past decade, we can also hear black holes in the sense of if you have two very, very big black holes and they come together to collide, they generate ripples in the same way that when Stefan was jumping up and down, it kind of generated waves. When black holes collide, they generate very, very big uh, ripples in, in space-time. And those frequencies that the ripples have, you can translate them to a sound. So let's hear a black hole. So here, for instance, I have two black holes. This is the first time uh, a collision was detected by the LIGO collaboration. And you hear the collision. Now, it's going to go again twice. So you heard it at two different frequencies. It's the same uh, event. The first frequency that you heard it at is basically the more realistic frequency for which they translate the data. The second frequency is so that it adapts better to your ears. Okay? So that lovely noise that I made you experience is basically the collision of two black holes. And in that sense, uh, we hear them. Very impressive, high precision measurement experiments. And those are the ripples, basically, that are, are being illustrated in the graphics uh, there. And finally, uh, we can see them uh, in the sense that, well, they are black. So in the middle of that picture, it is black, <laughs> so you don't really see it. Uh, but what uh, astronomers have been able to do in recent years is basically detect a matter that is surrounding uh, the black hole. And it's very, very densely packed and concentrated. And to illustrate to you why this picture is so impressive, it was so difficult to capture, it's because of this reason that black holes are so, so, so dense, so tiny. So if you tell me how big is a black hole, imagine here I, I picked uh, objects that are perhaps more familiar to us. So to be very dramatic, imagine you're a human being that weighs 70 kilograms. So I'm looking at the bottom there line. I'm assuming, well, I am not 1.8 meters. I'm shorter, <laughs> but okay, let's... Um, okay, uh, assume that you're 1.8 meters tall. If I grab those 70 kilograms and compress them, into a black hole, all that mass into making it into a black hole, your size will not be 1.8 meters, it will be 10 to the minus 25 meters. Very tiny. And for bigger objects, so for instance, if you grab the sun, which is the first example there, it's just to show how different the actual size of the sun, so it's something like 10 to the 8 meters, compares to about uh, 3,000 meters. So even making the sun into a black hole, it basically shrinks it to something that is even smaller than Earth. And so that's why it's so difficult to see the black hole, because they're very, very tiny objects. They occupy uh, very, very little space in the sky. So the amount of precision that they need in order to make that image is basically the measuring a hair on the surface of the moon. So imagine the type of telescope and the type of instruments that you need to be able to see a hair on the surface of the moon. It's quite, quite difficult, very, very challenging type of science. But it, it's great we're alive to see this. And so now here I present to you the black hole. Very good. Now, but uh, I am a theorist. So these are observations that tell me that I'm not imagining things and I'm not a crazy lady studying crazy things. Um, but let's talk about crazy aspects of black holes. So let's go into the, their quantum uh, behavior. And one of the revolutions, one of the things that have dictated my career uh, and uh, made me obsessed about what are black holes 
is something that happened during the 70s that basically told us uh, that black holes, in, in in, in when we study them from a theoretical point of view, are objects that carry quite a lot of information and in, in novel ways. Of course, they, eat, they carry a lot of mass, but what is not so obvious is the fact that uh, they carry entropy, they behave, there's a sense in which they behave thermodynamically, and by entropy here, what I mean in physics, entropy means that they carry information. It's a way how we measure uh, how many states, how many configuration an object has, and, and it gives you a measure about basically disorder or order of a system. It tells you something about the heat uh, of a system. Okay, that's what we call entropy uh, in physics. And black holes carry entropy. This was not expected. It was not obvious. Uh, and, and it's quite a beautiful formula that I love to write down because it has just inspired me for so many years. It's, it's been truly like uh, magnificent. I know, I, well, I hope you believe me uh, because I'm, I don't have the time to give a lecture on, on where this formula comes from, but it's truly magnificent. And one of the things that I want to highlight about this formula that is fantastic is these numbers that show up there. There's three fundamental constants of physics that go into that equation. The speed of light, Newton's uh, gravitational constant, and h-bar, which is basically the Planck constant. Why are these constants important? Because these constants are basically governing different aspects of phenomena and scales in physics. This constant g, Newton's constant, tells us about uh, the magnitude of interactions and forces when objects are very massive or not. So it tells us something about the mass range that you're exploring. The speed of light tells us about the speeds that objects move, if you're moving very fast or very slow. And h-bar is the one that tells us about the quantum world, that tells us if we're studying objects that are very big or very, very, very small. And the black hole here Basically, in this equation, in this beautiful equation that I'm describing, basically tells you that the black hole knows about all of these scales. If you want to explain this equation, so this is an equation that basically tells us an effect, but it's not telling us the cost. So if we wanted to understand the cost of that equation, what was the principle and the law that gave rise to that equation, we need to understand physics in many, many different situations and scenarios at many different scales that involve different masses, different speeds, and different sizes. And this is our biggest and most important motivation to understand what is quantum gravity. So, very good. We're experts now in black hole physics. Uh, and so that, that's where we are right now. So what I want to do in, in this uh, last portion is go through the concept of the holographic principle. So given this observation that it made sense to make the classical world meet the quantum world, how do we go about it? What is our modern way to understand what quantum gravity is? And what I'm going to explain right now, it's, it's the outcome. It was motivated by black hole physics it was made very precise in the context uh, of string theory, which is the, the, the field that I belong to. Um, but the best way how to explain what holography is, is with a can of soup. So this is when, when I talk about holography, this is by far the most uh, accurate way how to uh, um, share and convey what the concept is. So when you go to the store, and you want to buy soup, canned soup. Uh, the soup is inside of the can, right? And that's, that's what you want. Uh, but uh, when you're at the store, you don't open the can, drink it, and decide if you want to buy it or not, right? I hope no one does that, right? No, what you do is that you read the label, and the label tells you what's inside, okay? That is holography basically, what's in the boundary, so the label that it's outside of the can, determines what's going to be in the interior. That's what holographic principle means. And the can of soup is a pretty good way how to remember uh, what that means. 
Now, though, of course, you can make more mathematically precise definitions of what uh, holography means, but it's really that. The boundary determines the interior. Okay, so you can project if you have uh, an image, an object that is three-dimensional, you can project it on a surface that is two-dimensional, basically. Very good. So with this idea, with a holographic idea, is how we're nowadays understanding gravity. So the pictures that we make, and these are pictures that even we like to draw these cartoons in our scientific publications and so forth, is basically thinking that gravity is the soup, okay? So gravity is what's in the middle, and uh, the proposal that came from black hole physics and string theory is that everything that you wanted to know about the soup in the middle, this gravitational theory, can be encapsulated, can be fully contained on a quantum theory that lives at the boundary. That's it. That's the proposal, okay? It's a fantastic proposal. I'm very impressed. Um, <laughs> I hope, I hope you are too, but maybe not. Okay, but in any case, so to be uh, more precise with a can of soup again, we literally say gravity is in the middle and you have a quantum theory that does not have gravity that is living in the edge. And basically these two descriptions are completely equivalent. Now this is, uh, from, from my point of view, when I was studying physics, this was quite novel. I was like, really, these two things are related? No way, <laughs> but they are. So it's a very uh, radical way how to understand gravity. But most importantly, it's, uh, it's powerful and it's been quite successful because in this description where you're relating two things that seemingly didn't have anything to do with each other, um, you've been able, in, in the context of gravitational physics, to connect to completely different areas of physics that you might have thought had nothing to do with gravity. And this is where the collaboration and the synergies with different areas comes in. And when I want to understand uh, quantum gravity, I can't just stay in the realm of the gravitational physics. I'm forced to think about other concepts and other phenomena, and vice versa. Other phenomena and other areas of physics benefit from understanding what gravity is. So some examples here that I have listed is understanding the behavior of quark and gluons, uh, superconductors, which are important in, in condensed matter physics, fluids and, this, and the theory of hydrodynamics, uh, other types of non, non strongly coupled systems that are non-relativistics, and, and very, in the past 10 years or so, uh, the, the ties of, between quantum information and gravity has been really fantastic, completely surprising, something that when I was a baby, I think was not expected to be a connection. So uh, this is where it becomes a very, very powerful tool. So what I want to um, start wrapping up with is basically present to you three questions, three types of open questions about what are we thinking? So now you're giving me this proposal, you're telling me think about gravity now in terms of a can of soup, fine. Uh, I'm not hungry, I did have dinner. Um, but so let's, let me tell you about how now we're going to basically see this theory that lives at the edge as basically materials and tools that will allow us to build our theory uh, of gravity on the other side. So one of the first open questions that we have is basically uh, how does it work in many different scenarios? So when it came out of string theory, uh, it came out in the form what it's called the ADS-CFT correspondence, that's some jargon in our field, but it basically, it's an instance of a certain class of gravitational theories and how they're mapped to certain classes of uh, quantum theories. But we're ambitious, we're not going to just be satisfied with a certain set of examples, we wanna see how this applies to many, many, many different types of gravitational theories uh, with many different properties and not just certain instances. So this is an active uh, area of research nowadays. Another one uh, is basically trying to understand the map starting from the edge and going into the interior. So if you specify for me a quantum theory at the edge, what is the outcome? How can you make predictions about what is the, the precise outcome? And the final one that is a lot of fun and has had actually quite a lot of progress in the past 
uh, five years or so, is doing a journey into a black hole. So in this gravitational theory, you could have a black hole uh, in the middle, in the interior, and one of the questions that will resolve a lot of these quantum properties about black holes and understanding what are they made out of and why did they carry entropy is basically understanding the journey. So I do not recommend to jump into a black hole, wait a bit until we understand better what will happen to you. You most likely will die, but okay, but let's, um, <laughs> but uh, maybe other things might happen to you, but this is our current understanding, but okay, so uh, there, there is a at least a theoretical question of like, if you're in a rocket and you want to go see your daughter for some reason, um, you've seen the movie? No? Okay. Um, but, okay, but, but, but we do ask this question of like, oh, what happens if you're in a rocket and you want to go down into a black hole? What is that experience? And basically, what is the experience from the point of view of this theory that lives at the edge? How would you describe that process? And that will give us a lot of insight and information about what are these quantum properties that black holes uh, carry. So with that, I'll basically end. This is how we're thinking about uh, quantum gravity, and you will see pieces and ideas of this in this beautiful trampoline. But at the end of the day, what I want you to think in terms of this holographic point of view, that always think outside of the page. So you might think that everything uh, you can do is limited to a surface, but there's a whole world out there to see and vice versa. You might get lost out there, and sometimes it's convenient for you to just go back down to the surface. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>